Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Standing Committee on Education and Economic Growth. Today is Tuesday, February 8th, uh, 1.30 in the afternoon. Um, just want to uh, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, for our permanent members, we have Mark McLean, uh, Gordon McNeely, subbing in today for Hal Perry. We have Sonny Gallant. Uh, joining us virtually, we have permanent members Lynn Lund, and we also have Trish Altas. And we have a visiting member uh, who's joining us virtually as well, uh, and that is Ola Hammerlund. So we do thank you. We have a busy afternoon. Uh, very excited to uh, get an update on the work of the student well-being teams. Um, I'll quickly introduce who we have as our guests today, and then uh, we'll pass things over to them. So the acting program lead of student well-being teams, we have Elizabeth Kennedy. We also have the manager of Youth Justice Services, Daryl White, who's with the Department of Justice and Public Safety. And we have the manager for community health, uh, excuse me, community mental health and addictions. We have Connie Platt from Health PEI. So first thing, I'm going to ask for a motion uh, of adoption for the agenda. Mark McLean, so moved, and uh, we'll thank you, Lynn. Uh, we will start off with our presentation, so I'm going to pass things over to you all. Thank you very much. And thank you Matt, very much for the introduction. So I'm just going to share my screen here uh, with you. Everybody can see that, okay? So we, we just have a, a little presentation here uh, shared for you. We'll start off uh, giving you a little bit of background uh, information around the student well-being team, uh, talk a little bit about the changes we've seen over the past year. Uh, we've got some updated data information to share with you, and then uh, we were asked to talk a little bit just about the impact that uh, the pandemic has had on our program and services. So to start off with, uh, the student well-being team is a collaborative venture among three different departments. So Department of Education, Department of Justice and Health, um, where we focus on supporting mental health and well-being of violent children. Um, so there's three different, I guess, layers within uh, the program itself. So our first layer would be our frontline staff. And so we have uh, counseling consultants that are part of uh, the education piece there. We have social workers and registered nurses as part of health, and then we have our outreach workers as part of justice. And that team is the team that are based in the schools and they're doing that direct service work with the student. The second layer would be our leadership level. Um, and so we have a provincial team, um, and I would be part of that from Department of Education. Uh, we have supervisors from uh, health and justice and also now have a um, psychologist that's part of our team. And then the third layer would be the operations committee. And again, we have representation from all three departments as part of that team. And so, you know, any, um, any action that we're doing, whether it's servicing the students, whether it's problem solving, whether it's doing some direction setting, uh, those are all done through collaborative, uh, through a collaborative approach. So I'm sharing the vision and mission statements here with you. So with the idea of breaking down barriers for students and accessing mental health, um, and focusing on the well-being services for students on our island. We have four different guiding principles uh, that we operate under. The first is a student-centered approach, so the student at the center of all decision-making. Uh, the idea of easy access to the program, and this is the reason why we're based in the school, so we just eliminate that barrier of you know, a particular program not being offered in an area or maybe students not having transportation to get to it. If we bring services right to the students, we can make sure that they're able to receive the help that they need. Um, collaborative approach. So I, I already touched on that um, within our own team, but there's there's a lot of people that are involved in, in the life of a child. Um, so, you know, with it being based in the school, there are a number of different people that that student might encounter every day. And so we you know, need to make sure that we're collaborating with the school principals, with the guidance counselors, you know, with other staff that are also involved in supporting that child, just so we can wrap around and, and be able to provide them all the support um, that we can. We also do have some collaborative efforts with, um, with our outside, with community resources as well. And then a focus on early intervention. So we know um, that the data supports that that's best for student success. Uh, if we can get in there, do some of those educational pieces for students, um, you know, get in and, and intervene before um, some negative patterns are, are established, then we know that that's in the, in the best interest of the students. 
So we have eight different families of schools um, across the island, and um, each family of schools has a team that's dedicated to it. It's based out of one particular school where we have an office, um, but we do provide service to every single school within that family of school team. So our team would travel out to all of the other schools, um, and, and that's both for the public schools branch and for the French language schools as well. Um, so as I mentioned, the counseling consultants are that bridge, uh, they're, they're school staff, but they're that bridge between our teams and the school, that's our connection piece there. And then our, um, our team also have the, the health staff and the justice. And so this diagram just kind of uh, goes through the different roles within each of our teams. And so um, in terms of the health, health piece, um, all of those roles within health all have um, similar scope in that they focus on um, you know, the mental health, that clinical intervention piece. And so our health staff are working with students one-to-one. -one. We're also working um, sometimes in group settings as well. Uh, within the different roles, um, there's, you know, a little bit of a different scope in terms of the roles that they, um, that they do provide with the team. So all of our teams do have a team lead, and typically that's a, a master social work. Um, and the, that team lead or um, would also would be doing the group work, also the one-to-one -one work, but also would be doing the intake for students coming in to the program. Uh, they would be providing the triage and doing any screenings and assessments. Some of our teams, depending on the size, might have an additional social worker um, who would, you know, again, provide very similar uh, level of, of work. Uh, some of our teams might even have a bachelor of social work. And so when we have that in place, they might not be doing some of that, the clinical piece, that one-to-one -one piece, but uh, might focus more on the group work or on, um, you know, navigating services and community resources. We also have the registered nurses, um, and they, again, do the one-to-one -one support, do that group work as well as doing the health promotion. So they might link in and doing, you know, do class presentations around the health curriculum. They also um, do a great job in terms of providing the connection between healthcare providers and families and schools. Now, in terms of uh, justice, so we have the outreach workers, and, and often our, our outreach workers are working with students who, um, you know, have a lot of maybe outward displays of behaviors. Uh, maybe school engagement is, is difficult for that child or their, you know, it's school attendance issues social skills. Uh, so they often connect the youth with uh, the community, but also do a fabulous job of, you know, the one-to-one -one work, the group work, and also connecting with uh, the family. Um, and so our outreach workers, you know, again, if we're, if we're talking about, you know, a student that's disengaged from school and they're doing a lot of work with that child to try to re-engage them with, at school, um, doing that work with the family to be able to set up, you know, things in place at the home level um, that can reinforce some of the good work that they're doing at school. Um, and then we can have some really good success that way. Um, I would say that, you know, this, this diagram, like just taking a look at our teams and, and what we have to offer is, is one of the things that I get most excited about with the student wellbeing team, because I think it's just awesome when you take a look um, at the number of different people that are involved on the team and the different backgrounds and skill sets that everybody has to offer. I think it's a really diverse, um, you know, set of set of people that we have working together. That I think that we can really meet a lot of uh, student needs based on that. Um, one of the important things that just to mention as well, when a student comes into student wellbeing team, um, they don't necessarily just stay with one particular worker for the whole time. Um, and and I'll give you an example. We we might have a student that uh, really probably needs some clinical help. Um, but they're disengaged from school, they're not even attending, there's lots of outward behaviors. To get that student to sit down across from a social worker and do you know, some work on their mental health might not be uh, where that child is at at that point. And so um, you know, if we sort of take a look at what is the presenting behavior that we're seeing and issues that we can tackle, and maybe we might wanna connect that individual with an outreach worker, because maybe the most important thing right now is trying to get that student re-engaged in attending school. And if we can bring that student into, you know, a, a better place by doing that and, and the connection with home and reinforcing good things and have them experience some good success, um, sometimes we can bring them along to a point where they're then ready to sit down and work, right, with the mental health clinician. And so it might transfer from an outreach worker to a mental health staff. 
sometimes it's the opposite. You know, they've done some of the great work um, with, you know, the social worker. Uh, but in order to sustain that, we need to transfer them over to an outreach worker because maybe they really need to focus on social skills and being able to uh, develop some of those so that they can sustain some of the work that they've done. So there is some fluidity, um, the students moving around even within the team. And this just shows you, um, you know, just if you take, it's our um, steps level for care. And if, if you just think about your, your average population at any school, most of the students are in this orange band um, that's at the bottom. So most of the kids, they're, they're, they're doing pretty well. They have good days and they have bad days, um, but they, you know, have, they're able to adapt and adjust and deal with, you know, the, the stressors that are coming their way. They have, we have some students that move up, a smaller population that move up into that blue band. And so they, they're normally doing pretty well, but right now they're experiencing some difficulties and maybe, you know, they've moved into high school and it's their first kick at the can doing some uh, exams and there's anxiety around that, or, you know, they've experienced the loss of someone close to them and they're going through a grieving process. So, uh, you know, some of our students need the supports um, in that moment in time, right? And so we can engage with them to provide some of those skills so that ideally we want them to kind of um, move back down into that orange band where they're adjusting well. We've got a smaller percent of every uh, school population, sort of your five to 10% where um, there might be some diagnoses or, or a higher level or a higher acuity need. And those are um, typically the students that we might refer out to community mental health or, or other supports. We have four different kinds of services we offer within the team, uh, two of which require a referral and two of which are uh, without a referral. Um, so I'll start talking about the educational or well-being opportunities. And these are the ones that are geared at that orange band, if you think back to that triangle. So we gear these to, you know, any student, whether they're looking, you know, whether they're needing uh, direct support from us or not. And it's just those preventative pieces. So, um, you know, going in and, and doing a, a class presentation on healthy relationships um, or schools might come to us and say, hey, you know what, um, we've noticed that our students are, are having a lot of difficulties at recess time. Can you come in and do a presentation around, um, you know, conflict resolution or something like that? So we can offer those kinds of presentations uh, for schools. Uh, we also do take a look at the data that we have and try to gear some of the presentations that we are offering. Um, so, for example, if we notice that we're seeing a lot of students in grade 10 that are, um, you know, putting in referrals for service because they're really struggling at the high school level, um, that's good information for us to have because, you know, if we know that there, there's a number of kids struggling at grade 10, then we can get into the schools at grade 9 and start doing some of those presentations, preparing them for the transition to try to make that a little bit easier. Uh, the second piece without the referral would be the brief intervention. And that's, you know, when students just need some support for a moment in time. Um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of students that will just pop by the student well-being team office before school, between classes, at lunchtime, just because they need a check-in, right? There was something happened over the weekend that was a little rough and they just want somebody to talk to. So we do see students using us uh, for that reason. We also do offer a, a walk-in clinic. Um, it's off, it's running in, in one family school right now, but the plan to roll that out in other families of schools also. Um, and that would also count as a, a brief intervention. So students coming in, you know, for one, two, or even up to three different visits um, where we can, you know, just provide them that support. And then um, ideally they can, they can carry on and have what they need. For students who require more than that, we do have the referral services. Um, so there's the group intervention or the structured one-on-one -on -one intervention. And that's um, where, you know, the referral would come in, the team lead would take that and, and would uh, do an intake and then assess what would be most appropriate for that student. Um, you know, for many times the, the group intervention works really well. And so it's two or more students working together on a specific skill set that they're working on developing. So if you think um, in the lines of something like social skills, uh, that's one that works really well in a group setting because they can, you know, they're all working together on that the same um, on developing those same skills, you know, they have, you know, similar things that they can share with each other. And then you've got that opportunity to do some of that role play, right? And, and actually practice and engage in, in some of the work that they're doing. For other students, um, the structured one-on-one -on -one setting works better. And so that would be, you know, one student with one clinician um, setting up uh, support sessions that way. 
So a few uh, updates or uh, to give you over some of the work that we've done in the past year. Uh, one would be just around uh, the online referral process. So within the last year, our referral has gone from a paper referral process to online. So uh, people can go onto the website and right from our webpage, there's a link right to the referral form. Um, one of the great things about doing the referrals with student wellbeing team is that the referrals can come from anywhere. Um, so it could be, you know, from a teacher at the school, a counselor, a principal, um, it can come from families, it can come from outside uh, community, uh, from the outside community, and students can even refer themselves. So it's a, a pretty easy process. It's about a 15 to 20 minute um, process to go through the referral, uh, the referral piece, and then that comes to uh, our admin assistant in the provincial team. It gets forwarded to the respective um, team lead at whichever family schools team. And then, uh, and then the idea is that within five business days, um, the student or the family will hear from that team lead. So for that first contact, it doesn't mean the service will be starting within five days, but there would be that first reach out to the student or family within the first five days. Um, the second piece that we've uh, updated would just be around our communications. Um, so we, you know, we continue to try to get our name out there and let people know who we are and what we do. Um, you know, we've been around for five years, but, you know, you're still constantly, you know, trying to get word out about uh, the services that we do offer to make sure people know that, that we're available. Um, we do have uh, pamphlets that uh, are out at schools, they're out in the community, uh, but they also go out in every single kindergarten package. But we want um, families knowing when they've got new ones coming into the school system that, hey, we're here, you know, and your child can access this anytime from K to grade 12. Uh, we have done um, some work on our on our website, certainly around the communications piece. So we do have um, our website, as I mentioned, with the online referral right there. We also have a link from our website to all of the other family of schools teams. Uh, so if I'm a parent that lives in you know the Bluefield uh, district, I can go and I can click on the Bluefield team. I can see all of the schools that are serviced by our team, and I can see who is on. Um, the team and different contact information. We also have a, a compliments and complaints um, section that's been added to our webpage. So we always encourage, uh, you know, families to, to give the feedback directly to, uh, you know, whoever's been working with your, with your child. Uh, but sometimes people would prefer to do that anonymously. And so that's available uh, for, uh, for students and families to access. Um, and so if they lodge a, a complaint about whatever that would come through, our admin assistant checks those regularly, and then that would be sent to myself and then the supervisor in whichever respective department to do some follow-up. Uh, social media, we've, we've established a social media uh, presence. So we're on Facebook, Instagram, and uh, Twitter. We've also been looking at ways to be able to connect um, with the newcomer population. So we know that's a population that's really growing on the island. Uh, we have established some newcomer reps with, um, within our frontline uh, team. And then uh, with those newcomer reps, uh, myself and the supervisors, we meet quarterly with uh, the director for English as an additional language at the public schools branch, um, just to be able to anticipate some of the needs that schools might have. So uh, they kind of give us a heads up when, you know, there might be a large number of newcomer families moving into a particular school. Um, just so that we can do, you know, a check-in with the school principal and say, hey, is there anything uh, the students, you know, are, are in need of? Uh, would you like the student well-being team? They've, they've offered to, you know, do a session on, on familiarizing uh, the, the newcomer kids with things like the fire drills or um, lockdown, pro, you know, the lockdown drills that might be um, something that they've never experienced before to try to be able to walk them through and, and um, make that a little bit smoother for them. And so in terms of social media, we've also connected then with New Welcome, uh, which is a social media app um, geared towards newcomer families. So if we want to, you know, send out a message, hey, we're offering a parent session on this or a parent group on this, um, we can send it out to New Welcome and it would be translated into, uh, you know, a number of different languages for them. Um, walk-in clinics, as I mentioned, we, uh, we already have a walk-in clinic that's been established in the West Isle uh, family of schools, but we are in the process of rolling out walk-in clinics for all of our high schools. 
Um, currently, we have Montague uh, ready to roll out their walk-in clinic, followed by Bluefield, and then we're hoping for Three Oaks uh, around the end of March. And then the other schools will follow suit. Um, and we do have a strategic plan that we have started working on. So that's uh, some of the work that we started at the operations committee level. And we do have surveys um, that are ready to go out. We're just holding off a little bit with the transition for students just returning back to school. So we're holding off for a week or two on that. Uh, but we do have surveys that will go out to uh, students, families, uh, to school staff, and also to our own staff just to get some feedback to help guide us. Um, in our in our design of that, that will hopefully set some targets for the next three to five years with our team. And so just take a minute to go through a little bit of the, the recent data. So our, our data goes, uh, it's tracked from September until August. Um, so on this uh, first slide, it's showing you the number of referrals um, per year. So you can see that first uh, bar was 2017-18, uh, just 183 referrals. Um, now, bearing in mind, when we first rolled out, there were only two, uh, two teams across the island. It was just West Isle and, and Montague. Uh, the following year, we had it rolled out to four teams. And then it wasn't until the third year, so 2019-2020, before it was rolled out island-wide. Uh, but you can see the trend you know, over the years where we've had a steady increase in the number of referrals that are coming to us. Uh, this year, again, it's only representative of a, a couple of months so far. Uh, we were seeing a trend of about 120 to 140 referrals per month. Um, that has dropped off in December and January. We, we do typically see over um, any school holidays or school closures uh, a lower um, uh, referral rate. Uh, but we are anticipating, certainly now that students are back, we're going to see a bit of an uptick in, uh, in the referrals in February. So we are anticipating this year that we will surpass the number of, of referrals from prior years. Uh, this just shows the, the number of referrals based on family of schools. So with all eight families of schools, uh, the, the families of schools that have the larger um, populations, um, we're seeing a larger number in terms of the, the actual referral numbers for those teams. And then this next slide I find is really interesting because this now takes the number of referrals, but it's, it puts it into a ratio. So breaking down the number of referrals per thousand students. And interesting here, because the two that have the highest number uh, are Montague and West Isle. So not our, not our largest family of school teams, um, but they're receiving the, the largest numbers, but they were our first two teams that rolled out. And what that says to me, this speaks to me saying the importance of the relationship, right? And so we're based in the schools and, and we are establishing those relationships and building you know, good rapport with the students and with the staff, but it takes time right, to develop that. And so I think we're gonna continue to see um, some of our other, our other teams come along, but I, I, I think that's you know, where we see that West Isle and Montague are really established within those schools now. This next slide shows the reasons for referral. Um, now, these won't add up to 100%. This, this data is taken directly from the referral form uh, where people might tick off uh, multiple reasons for the referral. Uh, but the top three reasons that we typically see, and that's um, you know, standard over, um, over time, are um, referrals for anxiety, uh, for symptoms of depression, and for family concerns. We spoke a little bit about the um, educational opportunities we do or uh, when we go into schools and we do presentations for classes. Um, this is what this uh, graph here is showing us is the number of uh, presentations that happen by year. Uh, you can see first year, again, only two uh, teams rolled out, um, so 105. And then the next year, there was a huge um, uptake in, in the number of presentations that were being done. So part of that was uh, our team trying to get out there and get their get the team known um, and, and do some of this work that we know was really, really important. It was a way of, of getting the schools to know who we were. So there was a very big push, push on that the second year. You can see it's kind of uh, trended downward over time. And, and part of the reasoning for that, um, it's, it's great work to be doing. It's really important work. Uh, but we're seeing that steady increase in the number of referrals that we're having uh, but with the same volume of staff, right? So we're seeing less time uh, for some of those other um, those other components as as staff are balancing, you know, the 
the caseload that they do have and also balancing um, us getting into a position of having a, a wait list. And so that's uh, this next slide here is just showing uh, the wait list over, over time for this calendar year. Uh, we, we weren't in a position of having a wait list up until spring of, of uh, last year. And that's when we started to see it coming in with some of our teams. Um, again, in the summer, our referrals kind of dipped down a little bit when school's out. Um, so some of our teams were able to catch up a little bit, but not to the point of eliminating the wait list. And we're seeing that uh, over the course of this year is increasing and we certainly anticipate that that will continue. So just to talk a little bit about uh, um, some of the impact uh, from, uh, you know, since the pandemic began and certainly over the last uh, year with the increased restrictions and, you know, some of the school closures, um, we, we are still, we're still operating, we're still offering our services. We still see referrals coming in, as I mentioned, when school's out, uh, the referrals are a little bit lower in numbers, but services are still happening. Um, there's, you know, certainly it might look a little bit different than what it looked before, but it was still happening. So uh, those one-to-one -one, um, sessions, you know, we're still reaching out to students. Uh, for the most part, those were happening virtually. Um, there are, you know, some students that for whatever reason, you know, the virtual uh, wasn't, um, wasn't appropriate. And so, so for those students, uh, arrangements were made to, to meet with those students in person. Um, but the vast majority were being done virtually. Um, groups, some of our groups were even able to happen. Um, we did have some groups that we did put on hold. Um, for example, you know, we do some groups around um, supporting students when, you know, when families are, are breaking apart and going through separations or divorce. Um, it would be really difficult for a student to, you know, sit down on a computer and engage in a virtual session talking about, you know, this happening when a parent is in the next room and could overhear. So some of those groups, you know, we had, we had chose to kind of take a pause on those, um, but other ones were able to happen. Um, the the walk-in clinic, for example, it was another thing that was able to continue. Uh, typically the, the West Isle team runs that, that, you know, there's a particular day every week where students are invited to, you know, fill in a form to sign up for walk-in clinic and they just pop down to the office. So it looked different. Um, but it was that connection, you know, we've got those relationships with the school staff. So it was a connection with the, uh, the, school, the school principal saying, hey, you know what, can you get this messaging out to the community that the, the walk-in clinic is still happening? Uh, they just need to contact us here to set up the time. So those things were still able to, to happen. As I said, they just looked a little bit different. Um, in terms of our outreach workers, they've got, you know, some of those good connections with the homes and with the families. And so, you know, we had families contacting, you know, our workers saying, hey, you know what, we need a Chromebook. Can you, um, you know, are you able to arrange that for us? So our outreach workers, you know, coordinate that with the school, drop it off at the student's house. Um, they were helping to coordinate if there were, you know, was a need for, for a family to be um, connected with some food resources or other school resources. Um, so just looking for ways to, to be able to still make it work and continue those connections with, with students. Uh, we had we had one team that uh, that had shared with us as well that, you know, often kids, they might not be part of our caseload, but they come and they check in with the team regularly. So they might come in and, you know, check in with the team before school or over lunchtime. Um, so again, having that connection with the school principal saying, you know what, I don't have a way to contact these four students, but they normally check in every day. Can you get a message to them? And here's a link and we can just do a virtual lunch check in. And so they were still able to maintain that connection with the kids um, through through those methods. Um, one of the the things that you know we sometimes get asked is you know how how hard has this been for the students um, to you know to deal with with these school closures and everything. And, and for many of our students, it, it was difficult. It was tough. Um, but with the students that we support. Um, some of our students did really well when they were not in school, right? Because it took, they might be kids that, that struggle with school, um, struggle academically, struggle with social skills. And so removing some of those pressures, they were doing really well at home. And so our, our staff would do those check-ins with them and they were like, no, nope, I'm doing pretty well. Now is when we're starting to see some of those students um, struggle, right? Now that there's a transition out of the home, back to school, back into these routines and back into some of these stressors. Um, that, that now uh, they're really needing to support some of those students. Um, so I just want to take a minute just to, you know, thank you for, for allowing us here today just to kind of uh, share a little bit about uh, the work that our, our team has been doing. 
it's certainly, you know, we've had some difficulties and some struggles, but um, the student wellbeing team, you know, you can see from, from the data, we continue to grow. Um, we continue to receive the numbers for the referrals. Um, I think this is something, you know, our team, we, we really need to, to celebrate the fact that we are seeing the trend uh, with, with the number of the referrals coming in, because that's a huge barrier uh, to be able to break down is to have people uh, willing to ask for and accept help. So I think that's an amazing, uh, you know, success in terms of the team. We have absolutely fabulous um, staff on the student wellbeing team. Our frontline team is absolutely amazing. Uh, they are invested in the kids. They're invested in the program. Uh, we've got a leadership team that I think is, is wonderful. They collaborate really well uh, together and I think have a great understanding and respect for what each uh, department brings to the table. Um, and I'm really excited to, you know, to see the, the program continue to grow and develop because I know we're really making a positive difference in the lives of, of the island kids. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, so what we will do now is we will open up the floor to questions. Uh, just a reminder for everyone and for our presenters that um, I'll leave a little bit of a brief pause at the end of the question. And that way, uh, the broadcast team can make sure that they're on. And if you do want to add something, by all means, uh, just go ahead and I'll recognize you. I might interrupt you a little bit just to recognize you. So uh, we're going to start things off with uh, Gord McNeely. Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, just, uh, I, I guess uh, my, my initial question is that um, the last, say the last two months since school was out, um, there's been a lot that happened. Um, I, I talked to a lot of parents who were anxious about the, about the back to school return, um, but I, I don't often talk to as many kids about that. What is the initial, I mean, it's only been a short little time. How, how, are, the, how are the kids doing? How, how, what's your sense of how they are uh, getting back at this time? And um, uh, I guess I'll start with that. I have a tendency to ask a few questions in a row, but I'll just start with that. And anyone who wants to take the, uh, or answer the question, by all means, just unmute yourself and uh, go ahead. I can answer. Um, so, you know, any type of transition, it usually takes longer than we think. Um, so adults often um, transition pretty quickly from one situation to the other. Um, for students, it's usually um, a much longer um, transition that happens. So it's like the first week of school. We never, or we usually don't get referrals the first week of school because kids are excited. Um, routines are just being developed. Um, you know, people are getting to know each other. So it takes a little time. I would say that we're probably going to see the biggest um, kind of outcomes or the, the different changes in the next two to three weeks. Um, and that's where we're going to start to see the students um, struggling a little bit more and when we're going to start to hear from families that they need a little bit more support. Um, but like Liz said, there's, there's pros and cons. I mean, students aren't all the same. Some respond really well to being in the school environment. Um, for some, that's not the best environment for them. Um, and it's a it's a challenge. So uh, yeah, I would as I right now people are are doing well. They're reaching out for what they need. But in the next couple of weeks, we'll start to see the ones that are struggling with that uh, transition back. Gordon. Um, so during the um, during the month of January, how were your teams able to um, engage with people? Uh, to provide them with um, with the supports they needed at home, were you able to reach out? Um, was there any um, uh, you know physical wellness activities that you were able, you and your able, your teams were able to do for people, uh, mental uh, mental health and wellness for 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 your clients at home? Maybe uh, can you just tell me what the process was like for your teams uh, during the month of January during the lockdown? I can speak on behalf of the health um, staff. Um, most of them were continuing with the services that they were doing prior to the school closure. Um, there were some families that uh, felt that things were um, stable and that things were going okay. So we didn't have as maybe uh, as great um, as a service at that point, um, just because it wasn't required. Um, but yeah, there was lots of different ways. People were connecting online. We were doing in person when it was needed. Um, lots of different, um, you know, kind of coping strategies, and that could include, you know, kind of physical health um, things or mental health uh, strategies. So, 
um, yeah, a lot of the families, we were just open to whatever it was that they needed at the time, and we did our best to provide it. Gord? Um, yeah, I'm just looking at your slide where it says the student well-being registered nurse. So I'm a big uh, advocate for health promotion, proactive health promotion. Um, physical activity can help a lot of the different streams, but I understand. I see here it's a lot to do with the the mental wellness of the of the of the child for sure, and I agree. But what is being like in this little section under student well-being registered nurses? There you see health promotion underneath, and I'm just interested. What does that mean to the groups, and is that proactive, or um, can you talk to me a little bit more about your health promotion or your 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 almost your you know uh, how you deal with that like what does health promotion mean in terms of the student well-being teams um sorry i don't know how long to pause but i think that was <laughs> enough um so there's many different um ways that we provide uh that wellness promotion, maybe I'll say, instead of kind of mental health. We are very aware of the connection between physical health and mental well-being. Um, and so there's different um, topics that we present on in classrooms or in schools. Um, but also, you know, all of our clinicians, when you're doing a, a psychosocial, physical, mental health, um, cultural experienced assessment, then part of that would be um, including um, different things around physical health. So you might be looking at sleep hygiene, you might be looking at just basic, you know, kind of movement and exercise, um, but that would be individualized based on uh, the student's needs. Gordon? Yeah, um, so maybe maybe just a, a couple questions on, on um, the diversity of the makeup of your teams. Um, as well as what it's like to, um, I know you mentioned that brief thing about newcomers and, and new welcome, and I understand that, um, but, but there is, there, there, there's, there's something to be said about um, maybe you have a, a, a young black child that might need the support um, and, and uh, of somebody uh, that looks similar to him. Uh, what, what, how diverse is the makeup of your teams and how do you provide that child with something that, um, that, that he might have a few, few different needs in that sense. Can you just talk about that? I don't know if anyone wants to take that one. <laughs> I guess I drew the short straw on that one. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I, I don't really have a have a clear answer. It's something that's, you know, we, we kind of problem solve and work through with each individual situation. And, and I've been asked that. We, we did a presentation for some students at uh, Holland College, and that was something that came up there as well, um, you know, with, with different students coming in. Sometimes um, we do have a request for, um, you know, for a, a particular person that a student, you know, for a student to work with. And so sometimes when we do the referral process, um, that can also feed into the wait time that the student might have, because we might be able to connect them with somebody. Um, but, you know, for whatever reason, they might do better with a different worker. And so we kind of, um, you know, assess that and, and have the you know, conversations, you know, with, with the student or with the family um, you know, or are you okay waiting for this because we can do this right now or, um, you know, we can have you on the wait list and wait until so and so might come up. Um, part of us, you know, part of our team is, is that whole collaboration piece. Um, and, you know, if, if there's something that a student is needing to support um, them on the team or, or needs to be done with our staff in terms of providing some professional development for our staff, uh, then we look at ways to be able to collaborate with, you know, different organizations and different groups um, to be able to equip ourselves with that and then be able to provide that to help support the student. Gord, one more and then we'll uh, move on. Yeah, and, and just keeping with that theme, I mean, because uh, it, it's things that I hear from different families and, um, you know, like you look at the, 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 the way our island's changing and I, I, I guess I, I want to ask your team, um, how do you plan on diversifying your, the, 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 your working group? Um, because it's very specific to a lot of different um, uh, different fields, and I guess um, I, I want to make sure that that you're looking at um, those issues in terms of uh, of your organization as a whole. So 
Um, just just looking for maybe a, a, a few uh, words on that. So I can speak to that. Um, so I'm relatively new back to Prince Edward Island. I was gone for 24 years and in the province that I worked previously, um, when I was hiring, I always had the ability to give extra score points um, around cultural diversity. Um, so it is something that I've um, spoken to the Public Service Commission about, as well as the people in my um, leadership team, senior leadership team, um, because I do see the relevance, I see the importance. Um, and I, my hope is that, you know, at some point we are going to be able to um, give you know, more opportunities for individuals so that we have a more diverse uh, work population. Thank you, Connie. Uh, next, we're going to move to Lynn. Thank you, Chair. And thank you all so much for joining us today. I must say, every time we hear about what's going on with the student well-being teams, whether it's from these presentations or from our conversations with parents, it's really clear that the work that you're doing is so valuable. So thank you for taking the time to talk to us about it today. I was curious, you did mention some of the impacts of COVID, having to go virtually and having to adapt a little bit, but I was curious if there might have been any other implications from COVID restrictions that you haven't had a chance to touch on yet. I'm wondering specifically if restrictions have limited you in capacity ways or even when we're outside of lockdowns, if, if you could be able to speak to that at all. So one of the things I can start on and then, uh, you know, Connie or, or Daryl, feel free to weigh in, um, is, is just, you know, we're still able to make it work, but sometimes we need to use a little bit of creativity to make it work, right? Um, and so the fact that our, our program, we're based within the school, and so we need to follow regulation and regulations and guidelines that are set out by the school, uh, but also need to be responsive to, you know, what is set out within our three different departments. Um, and so I'll give an example. Um, one would be that that impacts our health staff would be uh, the fact that schools require proof of vaccine. So any visitor coming into the school has to show proof of vaccine, uh, proof, of, proof of vaccination status. And um, yet our healthcare providers are in a position that they can't turn people away for service. And so knowing that, um, you know, we just look for ways to be able to make it work. And, and if we know that, you know, having a parent coming into school is going to have this, then our, you know, staff member will pick up the phone, give that parent a call and say, hey, listen, we've got an appointment coming up. Um, we can meet in the school if that works for you, but here's the regulation to meet in the school. Are, are you okay to be able to provide that proof of vaccine status? And if you're not, then we've got some other options. So we can meet virtually or we can meet in a different location. So ways to make it work, we just kind of, you know, have to have to do a little bit of problem solving. Lynn? Yeah, that's a great example. I can absolutely see how that would be, um, like you were saying, some problem solving that would be required. I'm curious, I know that the student well-being teams are generally based out of one school and then they move around to the other schools. With COVID, were there limits on how many schools you could visit in a given amount of time as you were trying to keep contact small or, or was that not a factor at all? Uh, and nope, yeah, it's a factor. Um, so, um, you know, we uh, ideally have asked that all staff remain in one school for the day so that they're not going back and forth between schools. Um, so it has uh, created, you know, uh, a new challenge for them to, you know, schedule students all on the same day at the same place. Um, but that's across health that we're doing that, you know, even as a manager myself, I'm only going to one site per day. So, um, you know, we're just following the guidelines that we have um, and just trying to lessen exposure. Lynn? Thank you, Chair. Yes, I can absolutely appreciate that that would create some challenges. I did notice that your um, wait lists are starting to creep up a little bit, and I think that's understandable. And I was just curious if additional supports or additional resources um, would be useful. I'm aware that we're going to be discussing the budget very soon. So just wanted to ask if those are, if those are things that you are asking for additional resources to help with those waiting lists or if you feel like that will self-resolve um, as restrictions change. Um, and just to address that, yes, I mean, it's, it's something that is certainly on our radars that because we do anticipate um, that those wait lists will continue to grow when you take a look at the pattern of, of the number of referrals we see. 
Um, and that was part of our thinking with, uh, you know, doing some work around a strategic plan um, to, you know, be able to kind of figure out where we're at, uh, what our goals are and what we need to, to do in order to get to, to where we want to be. Um, as, as part of sort of the precursor work to doing a strategic plan, uh, we do have an evaluation that's underway and a workload analysis uh, that we're going to be uh, beginning as well. Um, just to try to get a sense if there's, you know, some ways that we might be able to kind of tighten up certain practices or if there's um, going to be asks that we would have in terms of, of additional staffing. Lynn? If I could ask just one more question, Chair. Sure. Thank you very much. I will say that um, we had a presentation with the student well-being team some time ago. I feel like it was over a year, certainly. And something that was highlighted at the time was the benefit of having a full-time position that dealt with parents and in the community specifically, not that the same individual who works directly with the child would also be providing supports to the parents. Um, there was a number of examples given on why it would be more advantageous to have that as a dedicated position. And I'm thinking um, specifically of examples where you have an individual who perhaps needs some boundaries with screen time or with healthy sleep routines. And if you are trying to build trust with that child, and then you are also the individual who is instructing the parents to be more strict, it can be a bit of a, a bit of a challenge. And uh, I was told that when the student well-being teams were getting off the ground, that was an ask specifically. And then as those evaluations of the student well-being teams were continuing along, it was an ask again. I'm curious if number one, if that is still something that student well-being teams are asking for, um, a dedicated position for someone who can work in the community with parents, and if that need has been addressed. You may have asked a hard question, Lynn. I don't know if someone wants to take the uh, take the initiative on, the, on answering that. Sure. Um, yes, I. It is something when I when I came into the role, um, was made aware that that had been suggested uh, in the past, but it you know wasn't anything that uh, that we had available to us right now. Um, it has come up again, um, you know, sort of as a question. Um, whether that would still be beneficial, and, and certainly I, I know when we when we do speak with um, with the schools um, and get some feedback from them, um, that is a, a piece that you know they certainly uh, would find beneficial, right? It's it's a lot of the parent work, um, particularly you know when the students are in the younger grades, right? Um, helping support a lot of that at, at that time. Um, so it is something that you know has been on our radar. I know it's sort of come up again as a question mark as part of the operations. Um, committee meeting and and hopefully when we get some feedback from the surveys that we're sending out that will hopefully guide us as to you know that if that's something that would be helpful for parents or helpful for schools um, we might get a little bit of insight that way thank you Trish if you wouldn't mind yep Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I work with a number of grandparents in Summerside who are raising their grandchildren. And they regularly say to me they are raising kids now in what feels like an entirely different time than when they were raising their own children. And they have spoken about how advantageous it would be to have that point person that they could talk to who could give them some tips and help them navigate what is an entirely different landscape than when they were raising their kids. Um, and also when I speak to people who are working within the student well-being teams, that often comes up as well. So uh, I guess that's more of a comment than it is a question, but I can imagine that there would be benefits all around for such a position. So I don't know if you have anything you'd like to say to that. Thank you, uh, Lynn. Um, and I don't know if anyone did want to comment on that, but uh, if we uh, don't have any comments, we'll uh, move on to Trish. Trish, go ahead. 
Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I, uh, I really, I'm so interested in this topic and it's, it's wonderful to hear the update today on what's been happening with the student well-being teams. I know that when the teams were, were first introduced, I think you said it's been five years, five years ago now, um, uh, that uh, it might have been a bit longer when they first introduced, I'm not sure, but the scale up was, was quite quick, right? It was, you know, sort of introduced and, and scaled up. So I guess my first question is, you know, um, at the time it was announced that uh, these the teams would be doing individual interventions and group work, as you mentioned, and also that upstream component. And we haven't talked about social and emotional learning today, um, but it was indicated that that would be um, work that the well-being teams would be doing as well with all students, um, developing those social emotional learning skills. So, um, you know, how do we interact with others? Our, um, you know, self-regulation, um, just those, you know, those basic skills that are actually so helpful um, for students, for all students um, at every stage of life, right? Um, and when I'm, when I'm listening to your presentation and hearing that the wait list for um, individual student support is growing, um, you know, I'm wondering if there's, if you still have time and capacity to do that um, upscale uh, work around social and emotional learning for all students. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, and that's part of the challenge, right, um, is how do you meet the needs of the, the students who are presenting with the highest challenges versus how do you, you know, make sure that that front line or front end interventions occurring as well. Um, many of the teams um, that I have worked with are also um, coupling up with the student services within their schools, um, because a lot of the um, school guidance counselors are also doing that type of work. So they might run some of those groups together, some of the more social emotional skill building. Um, and then some of the groups we're um, offering are the same, that they're, uh, we're doing that, but it is for a smaller population. Um, ideally, you know, it would be lovely for it to be across the board, um, and we do try our best to support even just the curriculum around um, mental wellness as much as possible, but uh, that is, you know, kind of part of our struggle and why we're looking at the um, assessment to see, you know, where can we tighten things up, how can we make sure that the areas that we're trying to target are getting, um, are getting met um, in, you know, an environment where the acuity is high. So, um, so yeah, that's our hope is that we'll get more information on where we need to go um, so that we're able to better look at our resources and how to best um, address all of those needs. Trish? Yeah, and just, you know, a practical question about that. So as you're, you know, gathering this information, I suppose with these requests, um, should you, uh, you know, identify that you need additional capacity in, in any area, um, you know, would those requests then go directly to government or is that something that we, you know, the Legislative Assembly would see as well? I'm not sure what your reporting process is, but I would certainly like to know. <laughs> And that's a learning curve for me. So I, I don't have an answer to that. That would be something um, I would need to go back to the operations committee and, and ask what sort of the next steps are in, in that. Trish? Okay, thank you. Yeah, because I, I mean, uh, sir, like the work of the that you're doing, you know, as as well-being teams is so critical, um, and it is just so wide-ranging. And um, you know, I wonder as I look at your chart of you know the the people that uh, comprise your team and the incredible you know range of skills, if if you know there might ever be consideration for an additional position to be added to the teams that really does focus on that school-wide, um, you know upstream mental health for all students. Um, you know, it's great that there's, there's, you have the capacity to do group work, but it's not, it's not, um, you know, you're going to miss out uh, on, on that piece uh, of, of learning and social emotional skills are so good for all, for everybody. So, you know, I just, uh, um, I think it's, it's, it's certainly, I can see how it would be challenging to try to meet all ranges of that scale from the, the school, whole school, considering all of the, the individual needs that you're meeting as well. Um, I wanted to ask a question about the, the referral process you mentioned. Um, so since you've opened up referrals um, to uh, be accessible by the community and, and parents and even individual students, um, what is the um, uh, your sort of average rate? Do you see um, like how many uh, referrals do you get from teachers and staff versus how many um, are you getting uh, from community and teachers? Sorry, not teachers, sorry, community and parents and, st and students. 
I, I can't give you exact numbers uh, just because I don't have that stat in front of me, but I know uh, the bulk of our referrals are still coming from the schools. Trish? Okay, yeah, and I, I wonder, you know, if there might be um, other avenues to, to let people know about this, because I'll be honest, I mean, I wasn't aware that, um, you know, the public could could make referrals uh, that, you know, family members could uh, could send in the referrals themselves or students could even do that. I, that this is uh, new information. And I think it, it's certainly good that there are as many avenues as possible for students to reach out, uh, you know, when they when they have questions or they might need a little extra support. Um, so just, you know, something something to think about it. And, you know, what's what extra support? Again, I'm just trying to think of what else can we do to help help you do the important work that you're doing? Um, one last question. Uh, um, you had mentioned that uh, for some students during the lockdowns when they were at home, uh, for some it was less stressful because the school environment can be a stress in and of itself uh, for, for various reasons. Um, without going into specific you know, individual cases, I'm wondering if there are any general suggestions you can make about what more we can do to make schools more inclusive and uh, inviting spaces uh, for all students. And that's a really, that's a really tough one, right? Because uh, the students are coming in with such varied uh, needs um, and the reality is, is that, you know, for, for one student, the fact that there's lots of people together in one location and lots going on is super exciting. And, you know, that's where they want to be. And for another student, that is what causes the anxiety, right? I need to walk in. There's all these people around, you know, there's, there's loud noises that might go off, like a bell might go off and I'm not prepared for that bell to go off. So it's, it's really hard to create one environment that matches for all. Um, you know, so I think our, our best bet is, you know, is, is to try to be able to kind of equip the students to be able to find what they need within the setting. Um, so, you know, schools are, are great to, to work with. And I know a number of the schools, you know, they might have, you know, different sort of spaces that students can go to, like if they're feeling really stressed out, you know, there's a really comfy area in uh, the library that they can kind of sit and chill out for a bit. Um, our, our own teams do a really good job as well of, of creating inviting spaces within the offices. So a number of our teams, you know, have, have comfy couches set up and, um, you know, some fidget tools and things like that, that kids can come in if they just need a minute to kind of de-stress and, um, you know, have that connection with, uh, with, with somebody on the team um, where they feel like, okay, I can go back out to the next class and they might need to come and check in again at lunchtime, that's okay. Um, but I think just having a pulse on, you know, who those students are and, and just being able to provide them some of those little outlets, um, you know, to get what they need during the day so that they can continue on. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, so we're going to go to Mark next. Um, also, if uh, any of the other members do have maybe one or two follow-up questions um, after Mark, uh, we're almost about an hour in and our guests did say that they could spend a little bit more time with us. So we'll uh, turn the floor over to Mark. Okay. Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, I can't tell you, a very strong presentation. It, it was well done. It, it definitely uh, answered a lot of the questions, most of the questions the other members actually asked before me. Any breakdown by, um, like, grade level, you know, elementary versus junior high versus high school and services that you provide? Uh, so in, in terms of, like, numbers of... Um, for our services, we have a, a higher demand at the elementary level. Now that said, um, there's also seven grades that the data encompasses. So from kindergarten up to grade six, uh, whereas middle school, it's only three grades, the seven, eight, nine, and then high school, 10, 11, 12. Um, not, not considerably more, but certainly we do have more at the elementary level. Uh, the kinds of supports that students are looking for at that level tend to be a lot more uh, family related. Uh, issues and needing some supports around, you know, the home and some structures in place. Um, the the uh, older students tend to uh, to get. Um, we move into some some different sort of needs, and often our more high acuity kind of needs start to present more in the high school uh, kind of range. Um, but yeah, we we certainly we do have it broken down in terms of like the range of grades. We also saw a, a trend, it's, it's changed somewhat this year, but when we looked at our data for all of last year, um, by the end of, of June, 
we saw um, spikes in transition years being the big years that we had for re referral. Uh, so right before they make that change from elementary over to the middle school, um, the students going from grade nine into grade 10 into high school. And then we also saw a peak of referrals at the grade 12 level, um, you know, probably some anxiety around, you know, leaving high school and moving on to the next phase of their life. Awesome. Mark? Um, any emerging trends or declining trends and kind of reasons for referrals? Is there something that's emerging? Like you've been doing this for five years and you guys do a great job analytically of kind of measuring, you know, how you're servicing people, so you should be commended. But any, anything becoming more apparent or, or more concerning in schools, for, especially on the reason for referrals? I mean, obviously a lot of them are traditional, you know, growing up cha adolescent challenges, but is there, is there anything, you know, emergence of social media and all that, wonderful stuff that goes along with it. Is, is, there, is there some big trends that are kind of coming out in the last five years? In, in terms of the data, I would say the, um, the reasons for like the actual formal referrals that are coming through, that's been pretty constant. Um, so we, you know, it's the anxiety, symptoms of depression and family issues. Like those are the top three and those are consistent over time. Um, what we do see are just more of the requests, say, from the school. So wanting us to come in and do a presentation around a particular area. Um, certainly as, you know, more and more students end up uh, getting, you know, smartphones and onto, you know, digital avenues for sure. That is an area that we, you know, we have seen some increase um, in requests for presentations around, you know, healthy use of screen time and, you know, balancing that with some other um, activities. Uh, that would be the one that really sort of comes to mind for me would be just around, um, you know, around uh, technology. Okay, and last Mark. one, is there any opportunities, uh, I guess now, you know, now that we're in the Zoom, uh, Zoom info or Zoom space, is there any opportunities to do group um, work with students and, and it gives them that ability to be anonymous. I, I just look at anxiety or something. So is there, is there a mechanism or something that you're looking at in order to, you know, people, kids can sign up to, to an online course, maybe uh, anonymously, you know, how to cope with anxiety and stuff like that. It, it, and would it maybe help with some of our wait times and, and service and some of our, our students? Is that, has that been explored at all? Um, so on the Health PEI website, there is um, information about Bridge the Gap, which is an application that allows families and youth to um, access different services. And a lot of those are more self-directed, so online services. Um, for someone to attend one of ours, that would be very difficult. And clinically, it would actually be you know, kind of ethically difficult um, because if someone does express concerns around risk or safety, we would need to know how to be able to contact that person and ensure their safety. Um, so anonymously is difficult um, in terms of, you know, our service, but there are online services that um, are available for youth to attend groups or, you know, um, take self-directed sessions so that they can uh, get some help that way. Makes sense. Uh, thank you, Mark. And, and and again, another congratulations to you folks for you know having the mechanism to to submit complaints. I mean, to be that self-aware to say, hey, you know, we how can we serve better? So, can you talk a little bit to the types of complaints that you may receive, and what what, what are they around, generally? Uh, so we haven't really received a, a whole lot, uh, to be to be honest. Um, but I, you know, I think uh, certainly, you know, we would anticipate some, you know, some concerns or complaints around wait time. Um, you know, everyone, um, you know, the, any situation that you're involved in personally, or or someone you really care about is involved in personally, that's the most important thing in the world to you at that time, right? Um, and our teams are, are in a position where, you know, we only have X number of people, we only have X number of hours in the day, um, and we need to sort of uh, triage that and decide whether that is an immediate uh, response or whether that's something that's going to wait. Um, and that's not, a, that's not an easy message to give to somebody who, you know, is, is really advocating for their child and, and, and wanting the best for them and wanting to have that immediate support and be better right away. Um, you know, that's that's one that I certainly anticipate and, you know, kind of weighs on your mind about how we can kind of meet the needs of all. Um, 
I'm trying to think if there's any other that I would anticipate off off the bat. I mean, sometimes it's it's not always you know the right fit, right? So a student might start working um, with a staff member and it's just, it's not working out for whatever reason. You know, sometimes there's, you know, just you, you click with certain people and don't with others. Um, and that's something that our teams do, you know, work through already that, you know what, if that's not working, well, we, we try to make it work. And if it's, you know, there's something, a way that we can adapt the way that we're working with a student, then we'll certainly try. At the end of the day, if that's not the right fit and we've, you know, we've tried everything to make it work, um, then we can take a look at other avenues, right? We've, we've got other, other people on staff that, you know, maybe if it didn't work with one staff member, we can try elsewhere um, or take a look, you know, if it's maybe a better fit, uh, you know, a student isn't happy, you know, meeting at the school level, maybe they want to meet outside of school or maybe it would be a better fit with uh, something that's in, within the community already. Thank you very much. Thank you. So again, we are a little bit close to time, so we'll just have maybe a few more questions uh, from a few of the members. Sonny? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much for your presentation. Just a couple of questions. Um, so just wondering, you know, as we look at the future, so on your chart, you have 70% are anxious or worried, and you had about 490 so far this year, this school year. So about 85% of those fit in that category of the 490. What's the length of the transition or the length that they go through the program, that they get over their anxiety or their worry? Is that a fair question? Like, is there, do you have an average? Good question. Uh, yeah, it's a fair question. Um, I will say it's individualized, to be honest. Um, the program that we're using in terms of our clinical intervention is CBT and DBT based. So it's skill building, which means it's developmental. And every youth is going to have a different um, developmental pathway. Um, you know, in terms of how fast or slow that goes. Um, and we are really not in the business of eradicating anxiety. Our role is actually to help them to deal with it and to have coping skills to be able to live with it. Um, if someone has a mental illness, typically it's not curable. It's something that you have to, um, you know, kind of get the skills on board to be able to live with. So that's our goal. Um, so it can be anywhere between, I've heard five sessions and I've heard almost a year that we've had people on um, our caseload. Um, and it's really just trying to meet the needs as best we can. Um, sometimes it's moving them through that process because um, some people take time. Um, but the hope is, is that they, they feel like they've got um, some skills at the end and they're confident that they can uh, manage their, their illness or their wellness. Thank Sonny? You. Thank you. And just one more question. So, and this may have been answered. So getting back to the wait list, is there many people on the wait list and is it first come first basis or is it triaged? How does the wait list work and is everybody being accommodated? Um, so the wait list is managed based on a triage scale. So when individuals are um, assessed during intake, um, they are leveled, either a one to five leveling, um, and then that makes a decision on how quickly the intervention needs to occur. Um, so anyone who has safety concerns, obviously, we'd be seeing them first. Um, and in people who are stable um, and are able to uh, manage while they wait, um, then they would probably be placed on the wait list. And we also do manage our wait list, which means we do check in and send messaging um, to the family and to the youth while they're on the wait list to ensure that nothing's changed. Um, because if something's changed, we may need to up their um, priority level um, and we might want to intervene sooner. Um, but we're obviously always mindful of trying to get as many people off the wait list as we can. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Thank you, Sonny. Uh, Gord? Yeah, um, just two quick questions. Um, I, I noticed, like, with your partners, um, you'd listed you had justice and health and um, education, obviously, but uh, social development is not, is not there. Um, I'm thinking more specifically like foster care, group, home, group homes. Uh, do you work with the social development caseworkers at all? Is there is is that an, uh, something that you do, or um, just no? I just noticed it wasn't it was not in your slides. Yeah, for sure. Um, social development isn't part of the tri departmental. Um, program. Um, but that being said, of course, we do work with them quite closely. Um, if there's a youth who is in our um, service and they are in care and receiving support from a social development worker, then we would be in contact with them in terms of case planning and uh, treatment planning. Gord, one more. Yeah, and I just want to, uh, maybe this is a shameless plug, but, um, uh, you know, you have, you have eight teams. Um, you know, Winter Wellness Day is going to be coming up, hopefully here within the next I don't know. Uh, we're having 
maybe some trouble getting the actual date, um, but it's coming up soon. So maybe I'll just put it out there that this is an opportunity for maybe your teams to get together and challenge each of the eight teams to promote activity and wellness. And and uh, I hope to see, and I'll be I'll be watching to see what uh, what your teams do to promote wellness amongst the uh, in the schools. I don't know if that's more of a question or more like, of a shameless plug, uh, but shameless I will allow plug. it. Um, point taken. Uh, we'll move next to Lynn. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just have one more question. Something that Mark had asked sparked another thought in my mind. He was asking about the themes, so to speak, of what you see referrals for. And I know anecdotally, I hear from an awful lot of parents who are worried about the cyberbullying that their children are experiencing. And I am curious if you are also seeing an uptick in cyberbullying or if this is a theme, if you will, that shows up a lot for your student well-being teams. Um, I would say, again, and not in terms of the actual uh, reason for referral, um, but more along the lines of, of schools requesting, could we have presentations on this? I know there were a number of schools um, who had presentations back in the spring of, of last year. Um, I think there were about five or six schools that I'm aware of. Um, and, and we were I, I'm trying to remember who did the, the presentations, but I know we were in contact with them uh, just to say, you know, hey, if we're looking at uh, creating another presentation for our teams to be able to offer to school, you know, would you be able to collaborate with us? Um, and so our, our team uh, is right now kind of revamping some of the presentations that we have to offer to the schools. Uh, so we do have a presentation committee. Um, that is one of the topics that fell under sort of a, a broader range of, of just, you know, healthy use of, of technology, uh, but the cyberbullying being part of it and, you know, balancing your, your time on screens would be another component. Um, so we do have some teams that are taking a look at kind of revising um, those presentations. And then the plan is that uh, we will have sort of a, a menu of presentations that we're able to offer to schools and we can send that out to all principals. Um, and that way they can, you know, sort of select from that. We would also like to be able to, um, again, just, you know, a time management kind of piece is to be able to kind of direct some times um, that we can offer those presentations. So to be able to say to schools, you know, hey, we can offer you this many presentations in the fall, this many in the spring, um, you know, pick pick the dates that you want and, and sign up for the topics. And that way we can kind of build it into our schedule as well to, to make sure some of that work is still happening. Thank you. Um, so we're going to go with uh, Lynn, you're good. Move on, excellent. Um, we're gonna move now to uh, Ola. Uh, I think you had a question. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you for the uh, presentation. I particularly, it's a great service, and I particularly like the name well-being, which sort of indicates it's not just a mental problem in your head. It's your whole being, and I presume it's uh, very necessary to feel well before you can even start learning something. My question was, uh, it's a little bit concerning that initially you uh, spent a lot of, on your efforts on group presentations or guess really teaching, uh, whereas now you do uh, more consult with the individual students, which is both great and both necessary. My question is, uh, are you trying to move towards, are, is there room for uh, kind of preventive teaching? Like basically you becoming part of the fixed curriculum. Are you working, is that something you're considering? Um, yeah, that's actually why we're doing the review we are right now, um, is because we know that we've got competing priorities. Um, the one is the prevention promotion and, you know, um, a much greater role in the lives of all students um, versus um, the, the high needs of the students who uh, are using our service. So um, our hope is from this evaluation, we're going to have an idea of just how much time we're spending on each um, so that we can better balance that. Um, so that we're able to, to meet the needs of the whole school population as well as the individuals needing individualized services. 
Thank you very much. Um, so we do, uh, I just want to uh, thank uh, all of our presenters today. Um, I, I know you spent a few extra minutes with us and we do appreciate that and uh, we appreciate all the information that you do provide us with. Um, so uh, I, we are going to uh, continue with our meeting. I just, uh, and then we will be letting you go. We will be saying goodbye. Uh, but I just wanted to check with our committee members uh, before we go in camera. Are, is there any new business that we uh, want to bring up? No. Okay, perfect. So uh, before I ask for a motion to go in camera to discuss our schedule and our report to the Legislative Assembly, I just want to say a thank you to, uh, again, our presenters and a big thank you to the broadcast team. Uh, a lot of work goes on behind the scenes to make this possible. Um, so I just wanted to, on behalf of the committee, thank you very much for your efforts. So I will ask for a motion to go in camera. So move, Gordon McNeely. Thank you.